All this time, we've been using PEV as our only source of map entity data. But the thing is, that's just not right sometimes. If you look at the FGD or existing map entities, you'll see various key value names that have no equivalent in the entvar structure. Those entities do their own key value parsing. Let's see how. Okay, that makes somewhat of a sense. Key value data represents an individual key value pair, containing a name, value, and whether it's handled or not. Upon successful parsing, we set handle to true. All these variables prefixed with M are member variables of that class. This is just what we need. Key value parsing is basically started by the engine before dispatching all spawn functions. When it allocates an entity, it proceeds to dispatch all key values to it one by one. The very first layer it goes through is PEV, and if it doesn't find a match, it asks the entity class if it can parse that. The entity class responds with F handled. Now, because Half-Life SDK lacks any automatic way of linking member variables to key values, we gotta compare these strings manually. I mean, we could just write a system for this, but that's way out of scope for this series, let alone this one tutorial. So, you've seen how other entities do it. Let's go back to our first entity, Trigger Print, and try to enhance it. You remember that the alert macro has this parameter, which can be at console, at AI console, etc. But in our case, it was always at console. It would be nice if we could allow the mapper to choose the printing mode, so let's do just that. We could start either by modifying the FGD or implementing the functionality. Let's do the FGD first. I'll name the key value print mode. You can do it in snake case, camel case, or whatever, so long as there are no spaces or special characters and stuff like that. However, it won't just be a number. It's gonna be a choice between multiple options. The FGD syntax is a little weird, but this basically means that the default choice will be normal. Keep in mind that the numeric values must match the enum in the SDK, otherwise the mapper's gonna think they chose warning, but apparently it says error in game, or something entirely different. Next, we're gonna add this as a member variable. In key value, we'll check if the key value's name is print mode, just like in the FGD, and then we'll do a simple string to integer conversion. Additionally, you can also sanitize it. For example, it cannot be less than zero or greater than five. Finally, we go to the use method and instead of add console, we use print mode. Now, there's a problem. If we were to save the game and then load it, this trigger print wouldn't remember print mode. It would go for the default key value or maybe zero it. For this, we use the save restore system. It basically works like any other. The engine goes through every entity, determines if it should be saved or not, and dispatches the save or restore functions. These functions then write data to a binary file. For example, origin and angles, two vectors that is, would be written as 24 bytes total. Now in reality, a lot more gets saved. That is, the entirety of PEV, which is roughly 650 bytes per each entity. Now, you will probably never write these bytes manually, but rather, you'll write a table of member variables to be saved. Let's write something simple like that for trigger print. First, you're gonna add these to the class, a save and restore method and a static type description. Then, under link entity to class, you're gonna write implement save restore. It's basically a macro that's gonna define the save and restore method for this entity class. And if you peek its definition, you'll see that it basically writes some boilerplate for you. We're still missing the table though. The static type description array we declared in the class is still not defined. So let's do that. Now if you right click this field integer thing and peek its definition, you're gonna see that there's a bunch of stuff in there. You can save strings, you can save entity pointers, you can save a bunch of other stuff. Integers, shorts, bytes, booleans, and that's basically it. Now there's one little caveat. If you tried saving a bool this way, you wouldn't have a good time. Field boolean is actually designed for the big bool data type, not C++ booleans. This is probably due to Gold Source's Quake legacy. Quake engine, you see, was written in C, and C didn't have a built-in boolean type, so they used an enum, or well a 32-bit integer, to represent that. In MSVC, a bool is 8 bits large by default, so you'd also be overwriting the 3 bytes after it, which could lead to crashes or horrible bugs. Now, there is a way to change this. You can add your custom field types or even support STD vector or whatever else you want, but as I said, that's out of scope for this series. So the best thing you can do for now is, for any boolean that is meant to be saved, use the big bool instead of the C++ bool. And that's about it for this one. In the next month, we're gonna cover this mysterious data type called string T and finally start finding other entities in the map and manipulating them, combining all the knowledge we've gained from the series so far. And until then, 
Happy programming!